Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to Monday Night's Calendar. Hello, thank you for joining us. Here are tonight's main stories. Empty words, anger after a report says police could not have stopped a couple being murdered by the man they had identified as a potential killer. On this uh, case, you could not legislate for the level of evil that was presented uh, by Marcus Osborne. Hello, my friend, hello. Rob Hisco raised spirits and thousands of pounds with his incredible voice before his tragic death. Today, his killer was jailed. Honouring a fallen star exactly a year after his death during a match, Ice Hockey Unites in memory of Adam Johnson. And giving the past a future, we take a look behind the scenes at Bradford's Media Museum's £6 million transformation. But first tonight, the brother of a man who was murdered along with his girlfriend in their home in Huddersfield has dismissed as empty words a report into how police dealt with their sadistic killer. Stephen Harnett and Katie Higton were stabbed to death by Katie's ex-partner in May last year. She had raised fears about what he might do just days earlier. But today, the police watchdog said officers could not have prevented what happened. Amelia Beckett reports. Down, 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 down. This is the moment one of the country's most dangerous criminals was arrested. Hours earlier, Marcus Osborne had brutally and sadistically murdered his ex-partner and her new boyfriend at their home in Huddersfield. He inflicted 99 injuries on Katie Higdon before mutilating her new boyfriend, Stephen Harnett. His crime so depraved, he was sentenced to a rare whole life order. But in court, we heard that Katie had gone to West Yorkshire Police just four days before the murder, telling them she feared Osborne would seriously hurt or kill her. That led to an investigation by the police watchdog which has now concluded there were no issues with police conduct. There are 53,000 domestic abuse cases recorded. We know there'll be many more than that each year, and that's 1,000 a week. Many, many, many of those cases will report threats to life. And so the police have to risk assess and have to take into account the totality of the information that they get. And on this uh, case, you could not legislate for the level of evil that was presented uh, by Marcus Osborne. But it's an outcome which has brought little comfort to the families of the victims. Speaking in March, Stephen Harnett's twin brother Jordan said the police didn't do enough. How does a man who had a history of domestic violence and violent crimes get to walk free from the police station with no physical measures in place to ensure that he stays away from the victim? While the report found no wrongdoing, it did identify areas for West Yorkshire Police to improve in regards to safeguarding victims and releasing domestic abuse suspects on bail, both areas the force says it's been working on for some time. But today we spoke to Stephen's brother, who told us he found this to be a contradictory statement. How can you share ways of improving, he said, but not accept any responsibility? Nick Peasgood from Leeds Women's Aid believes the police simply don't have enough resources to deal with the sheer number of domestic abuse cases reported to them. It's awful because what we want is uh, if somebody's threatening us or you feel unsafe is to be able to reach out and somebody to help you and protect you. What we do want to make sure is that if people do report to the police that they're given that wider support in a more multi-agency kind of way. It is a case which has put the spotlight yet again on a force and a fire for its handling of domestic abuse cases. And while this report has found no wrongdoing, the families left to grieve say without real accountability, they fear this tragedy won't be the last. Amelia Beckett reporting there. Amelia joins us in the studio now. And Amelia, the IOPC has effectively cleared police of any failures in this case, but tonight a leading domestic abuse charity has raised some serious concerns. Yeah, that's right. The charity Refuge, who I understand has been working with the families, has said this report does not capture the urgency of the matter presented to West Yorkshire Police. They told us that Katie's reports of Marcus Osborne's threats were not treated with the seriousness required to keep her and Stephen safe and in fact they go as far to say as 
their deaths were preventable. Um, now, tragically, this is one of 11 cases over the past five years in West Yorkshire where the man who went on to kill was known to police. It's part of an investigation which we broadcast on ITV Calendar last week. Across the whole region, we found 18 women were killed by men previously known to police. And in fact, 15 of those women went to the police themselves, of course, tragically. Katie was one of those and it's that which is why Stephen's brother Jordan has told us this report has left him concerned for other women like Katie. Yes, uh, shocking story and shocking statistics too, Amelia. Well, as Amelia mentioned there, she's been investigating the issue of violence against women and in particular the killings of women by men who were previously known to police. Well, you can hear Amelia tell me all about her investigation on the latest edition of the ITV News podcast, What You Need to Know. It's also available to watch on ITVX. Here's a quick taste. Every time that a woman is killed by somebody they know or, or in their home or a family member, there's a domestic homicide review and some of them have been completed, some of them haven't, but from going through them, I found some really stark similarities. And in a lot of what I was reading and discovering, you know, they reached out for help. They, they tried to warn the police. Well, that's ITV's What You Need to Know, which you can listen to on all the usual podcast platforms. And for more on Amelia's investigation, head to our website where you can also find links to advice and support services. Let's have a look at some more of the day's news now. And police investigating a hit and run crash which killed a man in Sheffield have released more details about the car involved. The victim, in his 40s, died at the junction of Gleedless Road and Ridgeway Road on Thursday night. Police now say they think the driver of a black VW Golf made off towards the intake area. They're asking anyone with information to get in touch. School absences are likely to be one third higher in the north than in the south of the country, according to new data. The latest report from Child of the North has found one in ten children in the north of England were persistently absent for unauthorised reasons. It highlights how those from disadvantaged areas are at higher risk of not being in school. A five-year-old boy from Chesterfield who has complex special needs has finally been allocated a school place. You may remember we told you about Phoenix Ray's plight on calendar. He was told to attend a nearby school, but it was too small to accommodate his wheelchair. Well, the good news is he has now been given a suitable place, although he won't be able to start until next year. Now you're watching Monday night's calendar and do stay with us because still to come we've got all the weekend sport including this absolute belter from Sheffield Wednesday's Michael Smith as they came from behind to claim all three points. And Halloween high pressure. The rest of the week is looking mainly dry. I'll have the forecast which is certainly more treat than trick. Next, a man who killed his friend when an argument in a pub escalated has been told the family can never forgive him. Yes, singer and family man Rob Hisco was described as a local hero after he raised thousands of pounds for NHS charities and brought joy to many with his performances during lockdown. Well, today the man who killed him was jailed for more than five years. Katie Oscroft reports. Hello, my... Hello. Robert Hisco was for hundreds of people the voice of lockdown. His online and doorstep concerts helped them and raised £16,000 for the NHS. But in May this year, he suffered a brain injury and died after being knocked to the floor of a pub by a man he'd spent the day with. Nathaniel Phillip had known his victim for three years and was a close acquaintance. In court, Robert Hisco's wife, Christina, described how she often relived the horror of the night he died. She said her heart was broken and she was living a nightmare. She said her husband was the kind of man who would have helped anyone. The judge, Mr Justice Croson, described the death as a tragedy and he sentenced Nathaniel Phillip to five and a half years in prison. He told him, you counted Mr Hisco as a friend, but his friends and family are angry and they can't forgive you. Tributes were paid by people who knew Robert Hisco soon after he died in May. His organs were donated to give others a chance of life. You'd be just proud of yourself, overwhelmed with it all. I know that's what he'd have done, so hopefully we've done him proud. 
There was applause at a Leeds United match last season. Mr Hisco had been a lifelong fan. His wife and two daughters went to the game in his memory. Tonight, Nathaniel Phillip begins a jail sentence for killing a man who was his friend. Robert Hisco's family say he will now be singing with the angels and their lives will never be the same again. Katie Oscroft, ITV News, Leeds. And after calendar, the ITV Evening News continues at 6.30. Let's join Mary Nightingale to find out what's on the programme. Coming up on the ITV Evening News, England's £2 cap on bus fares is to rise to £3 as the Prime Minister warns of the tough decisions to be made in this week's budget. Nobody wants higher taxes. Just like nobody wants public spending cuts. But we have to be realistic about where we are as a country. Eric Ten Hag is sacked as Manchester United manager. So who's in the frame to take over? And the Halloween sweets that are more trick than treat. Well, do join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Thank you very much, Mary. We will. And staying with the Halloween theme it is, of course, just around the corner. And if you're someone who embraces the occasion by dressing up, you have probably got your costume planned already. Inspiration can come from many sources, but how much have you thought about what happens to it once All Hallows Eve is over? I haven't given it any thought what I'm going to do with my costume. <laughs> I haven't. Have no, you I not haven't. at all? No, I haven't. Why, what, do you, what costume do you favour? Well, you'll have to wait and see, <laughs> won't you? It's not Halloween yet. Spooky four and ten costumes are worn only once. And so now swapping events are cropping up across the region in a bid to make Halloween both more sustainable and affordable. Sounds like a good idea. Catherine Walker has more. For weeks, the shops have been stocked with the frightening, the creepy and the strange. But for customers at Boston Park Farm in Doncaster, the scariest thing about Halloween is the waste. I think there is a lot of waste done, I think, but you don't have to throw everything away every year. I think you can save it. I've got stuff I've probably had 20 years. You put it in a bag and you bring it out again. Um, I think it does produce a lot of waste, yes. Um, it is a shame that we can't maybe reuse a lot of decorations. Um, I think... My well, personal opinion is that maybe we should recycle more of our waste, especially for Halloween and for other occasions. I think definitely um, reusing uh, Halloween costumes, Halloween decorations, um, buying secondhand um, or using paper decorations would definitely help the environment. Yeah. Forget ghosts and ghouls, researchers claim the biggest monster this Halloween is plastic and in particular single-use costumes that can't be recycled. In fact, around 30 million people in the UK dress up for Halloween, with four in ten outfits worn only once. Overall, an estimated seven million Halloween costumes are thrown away every year, adding up to over 2,000 tonnes of plastic waste. I think these tights are the best. They're going to fit you. In a bid to tackle this, Halloween costume swap shops are popping up across the country. Oh, look, there's a skeleton. It's a pirate skeleton. At this toy library, you can trade in last year's outfit for a new one. Since we first started doing it, um, there's more and more families are using it and sort of remembering, asking, oh, when, when's the swap shop coming back for us to have a look at costumes? So definitely interest is increasing. I think people are wanting to live more sustainably. And it's proving a hit with parents who don't want to waste money on clothes their children will simply grow out of. We managed to pick up a couple of things, gave a donation, and then brought it back as soon as she grew out of it because it was barely a month, and obviously you only wear it once. Um, and we've been doing it every year ever since. So we bring the old stuff back and pick up something new. There's been a couple of Halloween parties that we're invited to, so. Um, it's quite nice for them to be dressed up, but for you not to feel like you're putting an impact on the planet um, and your purse, obviously. Um, so, yeah, it's just a really good idea and also it, less clutter in your house. The general mantra this Halloween is buy less and buy better, hopefully cutting down on the frightening impact of Halloween waste. 
Catherine Walker, ITV News. Important things to think about. Very important. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what, we can do a swap after this year. <laughs> I'm not Something wearing that dress. <laughs> I can see you, actually. <laughs> now, well, while we are thinking about all things environmental, young people who are bursting with ideas to protect nature from the effect of climate change are being encouraged to enter a competition to make their plans a reality. The Woodland Trust is running a competition and is hoping for as many applications as possible. And they're appealing to a group which one survey has found is the most concerned about the impact of the climate crisis. Kevin Ashford reports. Some of them have different herbs that you can actually grow and eat. We've got wildflowers. And... Moy Siddiqui was concerned about how the climate crisis was having an impact on people's mental health. So he came up with a way those anxieties could be expressed and grown into something else. Inside the box is a pack of seeded papers and these seeded papers have different mental health prompts. One of the prompts is let it go and it encourages the user to write down any stress or anxiety or, or any thoughts really that they want. They'll write it down on their Miko page, they'll plant it and that will turn into some herbs, flowers or plants. And it's about turning something negative into something positive and connecting with nature. Moise's idea has been developed into a product thanks to funding that he won in a competition run by the Woodland Trust who are inviting more young people to try to get backing for their ideas. We've had people who have been doing upselling for textiles, people who are running campaigns to protect ancient woodlands. So we're looking for any project that helps tackle nature decline or climate change directly. And we ask young people across the UK to put forward their projects because we can't think of any better way that, to help young people really kickstart these great ideas that they've got. The effects of climate change are a source of concern for many. And according to a survey by the Office for National Statistics, young people are the most concerned, with a third of 16 to 29-year-olds describing themselves as very worried about the climate crisis. One academic from the University of Bradford says young people have a vital role to play in finding ways to counter climate change. We can't leave it to governments or international bodies to solve it. Yes, they are very important, but without our kind of contributions, both in terms of innovations and also putting pressure for action, it will not happen. So I think young people have a very hugely important role in this. They're already doing some of it, but I think there is more that can be done. Moyes, who had mentoring as well as financial support, is hoping to start marketing his idea soon and see it grow even more. Kevin Ashford, ITV News. Now then, time for some sport, and it was an emotionally charged afternoon at Sheffield United. Zero Accounting Software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. Well, Arif is with us in the studio, and Arif, it was a tough afternoon for everyone at Bramwell Lane following the death of George Bodock, their first home game. Yeah, it must have been a really emotionally draining day, Lisa, for everyone at Sheffield United over the weekend as they paid tribute to their former player before and after the game. Manager Chris Wilder, who brought George Bodock to the club in 2017, laid this wreath on the pitch, reading Truly Loved and truly missed. Well, there was a game to be played and the Blades certainly put in a performance George would have been proud of. They returned to winning ways with a 2-0 win over Stoke. In doing so, United are yet to lose a game at home this season. It's an emotional um, last couple of weeks. Still don't think people understand the effect that it's had on all of us. Um, players, coaches, managers, people that work, work with George, people in office staff. Listen, I've, I've told that, so I think people might be a little bit bored of, of what I've said about it. Um, big challenge today. We had to make sure that we got the performance right, and I thought the performance was absolutely spot on. Well, United's cross-city rival Sheffield Wednesday also returned to winning ways, and they did so in some style. The Elves came from behind on the south coast to beat Port Smith. Josh Windass levelled things up. Then Michael Smith stepped up with this 25-yard rocket to haunt his former team. Not a bad way at all to mark your 150th career goal. Just saying when I came off the pitch, if I wasn't so tired, I probably would have taken a touch. So that goal might have never happened if I wasn't so tired. So no, just, it's one of those, it's either goes in the back of the net or it goes over the stand. Hands down, the, the, the best goal in my career so far. It's a nice feeling, obviously, to, to come away and, and get the three points and, and get the winners. It's always nice. 
Well, the cracking goals carried on into League One as Rotherham picked up a much-needed win to ease the pressure on manager Steve Evans. After being booed off at half-time, the Millers got their act together in the second 45. Goals from Jordan Hugel and Malik Wilkes secured three precious points. Well, Exeter proved to be no match for Huddersfield Town. The Terriers ran out comfortable 2-0 winners at the John Smiths. And Barnsley made it back-to-back -back away wins at, with victory at Shrewsbury. They remain outside the playoff places on goal difference. Well, Paul Cook says he delivered a lively half-time team talk in Chesterfield's win over Morecambe. Well, whatever he said to the players certainly worked, as they scored four second-half goals to thump the League Two basement boys 5-2. And Doncaster rounded off what was a winning weekend for all our South Yorkshire sides. They saw off Bradford 2-1. Well, today marks one year since the death of ice hockey player Adam Johnson and 47 seconds of applause was held before games across the league this weekend to celebrate his life. Well, the moment had particular poignance at the Sheffield Arena. It was there during a cup game for Nottingham Panthers against the Sheffield Steelers that the 29-year-old died after suffering a fatal neck injury. And just a quick reminder, you can watch our uh, do special documentary, Steel, looking back at how the Steelers responded to Adam Johnson's death and the rest of their extraordinary season, all on our streaming platform, ITVX. Yes, it was a roller coaster, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It really was. Thank you. Thanks, You're Arif. Welcome. Now, finally, it's been closed for more than a year, but one of our region's biggest tourist attractions is edging closer to reopening to the public after a £6 million overhaul. Yes, with Bradford about to take centre stage as the UK City of Culture, the Science and Media Museum is set to welcome visitors once again. And as Freyla Maud has been finding out, the venue has been given a real lift in more ways than one. Well, the museum's been closed since July 2023 and a lot of work is going on. And you can see that here already. The foyer is opened out. It's a much bigger space. Lots of building work going on. All very exciting stuff, as Joe <laughs> Quentin Tullock will tell us, the director here. Oh, all well underway. Oh. You've got your hard hat on. You must be so thrilled. We are absolutely delighted. It's very exciting because we can see the end in sight. As you mentioned, we've been closed since June last year, but we are well underway to reopening the museum in January. So what's been the, the most difficult bits of this refurb? Six million pounds it's costing, Six isn't it? Six million pounds, two major parts of the project. One is the entrance area that we're in now. And the big thing that we've done here is to build a new lift. There was already one here, but it was a bottleneck for us, particularly when we were really busy. So you can imagine a second lift will transform the way people move around the building. However... <laughs> it sounds really easy, doesn't it? Pop a new lift in. No, 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 no. We had to knock a hole through eight floors of concrete and dig a big pit. We're moving things around. We're taking the opportunity because of the lift to put some, to upgrade everything. So new floors, more seating, a much more welcoming space for people to come and enjoy the museum. But as you rightly say, the two new galleries, which we'll go and have a look at in a minute, will be opening in June next year. Come on then, let's go and have a look. Okay. So this will be where we've got half of the new galleries wow. so this is level three and above it is level five and we'll show you just how much space we've now created for these new galleries it's over two floors and we're telling the story of all of our collections so image and sound technologies photography film television sound technologies but we're telling new stories so we're really interested particularly in stories that are relevant to people in Bradford We've done a lot of work with young people to make sure that these galleries, the stories we're telling are really, really relevant and important to them. OK, talking of young people that you've been speaking to, I'm going to pop back downstairs and have a chat with one Fantastic. Of them. Oh, she should be just around here somewhere. Saman, how are you doing? Member of the Youth Forum, tell us what's it been like getting involved in the projects and what have you helped bring to life here? It's been great working with Youth Forum, working on the storytelling and behind the scenes and we worked on a lot of different projects and one of the projects is over there. So this is one of your ideas, how best to display Christopher Lee's vampire teeth mm -hmm. from way back in the 50s and your idea was cover the floor with blood, why not? <laughs> so this is the test palette, isn't it? I mean it must be great being able to come up with such creative ideas and then see them come into reality. We wanted to display the blood dripping down and that's where the pool of blood came from. You can walk on the pool of blood and be in that scene within the movie. Creepy, but absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant idea. 
So that's my whistle stop tour over. Can't wait to come back here in January and see the finished result. Oh, that's two. Yeah, definitely. A place I've been many times over the years. Yeah, yeah. You won't be surprised to hear. And uh, yeah, I used to love it when I was a lot younger, you know, going there and seeing all that old TV memorabilia. Very and stuff. interactive. Yeah, really interesting. Really How oh, here's Nick with the weather. Good visibility on the horizon. Tui sponsors ITV Yorkshire Weather. Hello, not a bad start to the week, half term for many of us. Bit of sunshine here and there, certainly on the mild side, and the gift of a double rainbow spotted by Sandy at Meltham this morning. Now, the week ahead is looking really quite settled. We've got high pressure building in, so we're entering a spell of a long spell of dry weather, mild still throughout the week, but overnight, just bear in mind there's a risk of some mist and fog around where we see some clear spells developing. High pressure is moving in. There's going to be a lot of cloud trapped underneath this area of high pressure. Don't don't expect a huge amount of blue sky on offer this week, but it will certainly be on the mild side. These colours indicating temperatures well above the average for the time of year. Doesn't necessarily translate, though, into a lot of sunshine. We saw temperatures up to 17 today in the best of the brightness. So at best around 16 now as the week goes on, as compared with the average for the time of year, which is closer to 11 degrees. So as you can see, we are well above that. Let's take a look at things through the rest of this evening and tonight. Still a fair amount of cloud around and we've seen a few patches of rain today more especially into the Pennines but some will just translate their way further eastwards as we go through the night nowhere particularly wet and temperatures we kick off tomorrow above that average daytime high so a really mild start to our day plenty of cloud around misty in places but gradually during the day the visibility improving and a few sunny spells developing here and there lifting temperatures to around 15 or even 16 degrees celsius and well Wednesday will be a very similar day as well in fact all the days through the rest this week will be very similar could be foggy in places to begin the day some sunny spells developing staying mild Tui sponsors ITV Yorkshire weather Thank you very much, Nick. Mild and dry in half term. I know. I never believe it. So dark though now, isn't I know, it? So early on. But you are coming back later to brighten up everyone's evenings, Ian. Oh, I'll do my best. Yeah, join us at half past ten, won't you? From us all here. Good night. Bye bye.